Now for something completely different. Forget everything you've been told by others before. Get ready for the real deal. The full story. Real talk about money, markets, life. Now, it's The Real Investment Show with Lance Roberts. Presented by RIA Advisors. Hey, good, <clears throat> excuse me. Hey, good morning. Welcome to the show. Of course, it's Thursday, second best day of the week. Getting ready to wrap things up. And again, you know, we'll just kind of get into stuff this morning. Michael Lee was joining me this morning, talk a little bit about inflation. Uh, and obviously, inflation's ticked up here a little bit over the last week or so. Everybody's kind of very anxious about that. Um, <clears throat> that's pulled interest rates up here a bit. That's got a lot of people anxious about that. So we'll get into what's going on and what does it mean, if anything, and what some of the, the most recent economic data is pointing to as well. Um, of course, also, we'll talk a little bit about the Fed. Lots of Fed speeches, particularly today. I think there's four or five Fed speakers out today, but this whole week has been Fed Palooza. So they, we've had Fed speakers pretty much just about every day this week, all saying the same thing, which is that, hey, you know what? We're going to cut rates. We're not in a rush to cut rates, but we're going to cut rates. And the, the overall language is becoming less hawkish for the Fed, right? So the overarching uh, kind of statements have been, yes, we're going to cut rates, but maybe not as soon as you want, but we're going to cut rates. So uh, definitely language becoming more dovish, uh, still a, a very clear expectation the Fed will cut rates um, as they're starting to worry a little bit more about the economy. But uh, importantly, some of the recent economic data is starting to really suggest that the economy is slowing down. Yesterday, we had ISM Services PMI, which showed a, a, a drop into contractionary territory. Employment is slowing down. Prices are dropping. That has a very high, again, services, 80% of the economy, right? That has a very high correlation to what happens with economic growth, inflation, all that, because it's such a big percentage of the overall economy. And that's where inflation comes from. So let's remember the basis of inflation, which is simply supply and demand. That's all it is. There's, you, can, you, you can come up with all these other reasons. It's debt, it's this, it's that. The other thing, that's not inflation. Inflation is only supply and demand. In other words, if I have more demand than I have supply, prices go up, I get inflation. Vice versa, I get deflation if my supply exceeds my demand. It's basic economics. 
Um, you can try to assign all these other reasons to it, but the very bottom line of this is it's supply and demand. And right now the economy is doing fine. In fact, there's a very high correlation. This is going to be in this weekend's newsletter, by the way. There's a very high correlation between GDP and inflation as a composite, right? So if we put GDP and inflation together, make a composite index, there's a very high correlation between that and the level of interest rates. And right now, the level of, of GDP and CPI is about 4.3%, right where 10-year Treasury rates are. So as, in, in, as the economy slows, and as inflation falls, interest rates will come down because interest rates are a reflection, obviously, of what opportunity costs there are, et cetera, being put out by borrowers. So inflation and interest rates will drive that. Some of the economic data is certainly weakening to the point that suggests slower rates of economic growth, a la inflation, over the rest of this year. So we'll keep a watch on the economic data, but that continues to be the overriding issue. Um, the, the recent economic reports continue to confirm that. Friday, now tomorrow, is the all-important employment report. This is the one thing the Fed is really looking at. So there's two things the Fed may be worried about, which is potentially liquidity, but also employment. So tomorrow that employment report will come out. Now, ADP was out yesterday. ADP came in a lot stronger than expected. It's about 184,000 jobs, primarily hospitality and leisure. Uh, was where those jobs were created. But ADP has been a very, very poor predictor of the BLS report. And so we'll see tomorrow what happens, whether we have another strong employment report tomorrow or if the employment report is weaker. But that's going to be the report that really kind of sets the tone for the markets come Monday, because, well, really tomorrow, because, again, a, a much stronger than expected economic report suggests that the Fed may be slower to cut rates a much weaker, obviously, than the Fed would have to act sooner. And that's really what's going to drive markets tomorrow is that going to be that employment report. But again, all that is where it is for the moment. And here's what you need to know before the bell this morning. The Bernie Madoff trend line remains exactly <laughs> in place. You know, we had this sell-off on Monday and Tuesday. And then, of course, yesterday, the market came down. And I, I mentioned this yesterday morning. I said we were going to open a little bit weaker uh, we were going to touch that 20-day moving average, and we'd see if the market would bounce, if those computer algos would, would kick on and start buying stocks. And they did. Uh, had a very nice bounce right off that 20-day moving average. This morning, futures are pointing higher. NASDAQ's up about 100 points right now. The S&P's up about 21. So again, this perfect Bernie Madoff trend line is remaining very much intact. Any time the market drops to the 20-day moving average, computer algorithms kick on, start buying that dip, and that's what we're seeing here uh, once again. So again, there's very little to be concerned about, and unfortunately, it's just, it's just one of those very boring markets that we're in. I wish I had more exciting news to tell you, saying, oh, this has happened, and eventually we'll get there, but right now, uh, it's just basically every dip to this 20-day moving average is just your opportunity to, to buy some more stock. But now having said that, bullish sentiment is very, very high. Um, there are, you know, I actually put out a tweet this morning talking about the fact that bear sightings are now extremely rare. Uh, there are very few bears in the markets right now at all in terms of, of, of investor sentiment. Bullish sentiment is extremely high. And uh, something I'm writing about right now for next week, margin debt is back on the rise as well. Now, again, margin debt is important to a rising bull market. So as people begin to become much more bullish on the markets and begin to leverage their bets, well, they take on margin debt to do that. Well, that's more buying power, right? Because I'm borrowing money to buy stocks. That is supportive of rising asset prices. And again, we're seeing that right now. Uh, we've seen a lot of movement into options, very bullish option strategy right now. Volatility index remains extremely low. In fact, we saw just a brief moment earlier this week where volatility looked like it might be turning up, but again, that didn't happen. In fact, over the last two days, volatility is dropping back down sharply again. So we had this very small spike in, vol in the volatility index that uh, failed to really materialize. And again, complacency has just come set back right in here. So again, uh, there, there, there's a very high level of complacency. There is no risk in the markets right now. There's no concern. Any dip to the 20-day moving average gets bought. But again, this, you know, this is just a function 
of that more extreme bullish sentiment. We're seeing it across the board, whether it's in institutional investors, which are now leveraged. Uh, as of last week, they were at 103% on their equity allocations. Uh, the Associ American Association of Individual Investors are some of their highest level of allocation since the dot-com crisis. So again, no matter kind of which, which indicator you want to look at in terms of bullish sentiment, allocations and positioning, whatever it is, they're all extremely invested in the market. In other words, everybody's in the pool right now swimming. <laughs> so the only question is, is when the tide comes out, who's naked? That's, that's who we'll find out about. But that's what you need to know before the bell this morning. Uh, when we come back from the break, though, we will pick up with Michael Leibowitz. His latest article is on the website right now talking about Japan and the lost decade and why they are the, the model. And we've talked about this on the show before, but Japan is the model for what's happening in the U.S. So if you want to know where inflation's heading, where interest rates are heading, where the markets are heading, all those type of things, just take a look at Japan because they'll tell you exactly all that. We'll come back and talk more about that with Michael Leibowitz on today's edition of The Real Investment Show. Don't go away. Get daily investment news you can use. Delivered at the speed of the internet at realinvestmentadvice.com. Got a burning financial question you've always wanted to ask Richard Rosso and Danny Ratliff? Stocks or bonds? Annuities or not? Who does your hair? Our next Candid Coffee goes back to our roots and back to the kitchen table with an open season session for any and all of your questions. Saturday, April 20th. What about tax loss harvesting? Should I take Social Security now? Where'd you get that snappy robe? Register today for our open season Candid Coffee at realinvestmentadvice.com for just about anything you want to know. Where'd you get those realinvestmentadvice.com Small businesses are now being challenged by the lack of employees and how to attract and recruit the best employees. To get the better employee, you'll have to offer a better package. Hi, I'm Tom Allen, RIA Advisors Retirement Plan Consultant. Don't assume a 401k plan is too costly or complicated for your small business to offer. Let us show you how to make the most of an affordable and effective plan that will deliver true value for your business and your employees. Call me toll-free at 855-RIA-PLAN or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. That's real investmentadvice.com. The Real Investment Show. When it comes to wealth management, most people think of stocks and bonds, but it's like enjoying one layer in a seven-layer cake. At RIA Advisors, we want to make sure you get your cake and eat it too. Social Security, Medicare, creating a tax-friendly retirement paycheck. Perhaps you're saving for college. How about life insurance? Guaranteed income solutions, all along with comprehensive planning. At RIA, a holistic approach to your money is our priority. Call us today, 855-RIA-PLAN, or find us online at Real Investment investmentadvice.com realinvestmentadvice.com and now another page from the real investment advisors investing manifesto a passive investment portfolio requires active risk management it's not a choice it's necessity diversification doesn't protect against risk of loss. Let us actively help you reach your financial goals with RIA Advisors. Neither bull nor bear. RIA Advisors. 281-501-1791 or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. You're listening to The Real Investment Show. Welcome to the show this morning. I'm your host, Lance Roberts. Um, we are having computer difficulties at the moment. Give me just one moment. Everything is crashing on my side over here. All right, I think we're, I think we can uh, hobble along here. So apologize for that. Uh, I've got all kinds of computer issues happening right now. Um, so a couple of things, uh, as we were just talking about, you know, one of the big questions we're getting right now, and I'm writing about this in this weekend's newsletter as well, is about this recent little uptick in inflation. Everybody's kind of, you know, all freaking out. I was like, oh my gosh, inflation's coming back. And, you know, this is kind of one of the, you know, overriding concerns f for the markets as well. Obviously, you know, this is the whole thing about the Fed and the Fed cutting rates. Um, 
but yeah, every time that there's a, a minor uptick in inflation, you know, it's it brings back the the memories of you know the the inflation surge we had back following the um, uh, pandemic shutdown, where we had, you know sent five trillion dollars worth of money into the economy, and it's oh my gosh, inf- inflation's coming back, it's terrible. Um, there's really no evidence of that, and again, when anything is trending in a direction. It just doesn't go on a straight line. And so when you're talking about inflation or disinflation or deflation, none of that happens in a straight line. Everything kind of ebbs and flows along the way. And again, uh, because we measure inflation on a year-over-year basis, you have mathematical anomalies that occur because you're comparing potentially against a very weak month of inflation previously. So if it upticks a little bit this, this year, uh, in this month, it seems like a much bigger move, and so you know you see you see a change. But the overall trend of inflation is falling, has been falling since June of 2023, and it's been declining from nine percent to now roughly about three three point four percent, and that will continue lower as economic growth and activity within the economy continues to slow. And we saw this yesterday, as I was saying, in the ISM uh, services report, which is 80% of the economy, you're seeing slowing across the board. Retail sales, 40% of PCE has been slowing. Consumers are running out of capital. Um, We're seeing savings rates drop. There's a correlation between savings rates and, and economic activity. So again, when we get into all of this, there, there, there isn't really evidence that we have an environment for higher rates of inflation. We may have an uptick in inflation temporarily, but sustained higher rates of inflation, we don't have the economic environment for it. The other side of that is debt. And that's something that we'll bring Mike in to talk about this morning a little bit too, because he just touched on this yesterday in his article on the website talking about Japan's lost decade. But debt's a problem. Um, Japan's 230% of debt to GDP, we're about 120 so you can countries can run debt for a lot longer than you think <laughs> without having, you know, complete collapse. But there are consequences to be paid for running very high levels of uh, high high levels of debt uh, to GDP ratios. Mike, welcome to the show this morning. Good morning. So yeah, uh, what was the the crux of your discovery or your article, I should say? So this art the article on Japan kind of sets up an article that kind of that will get I, I don't know it'll probably be the next few weeks but it'll say why we're not really like Japan but to some degree we're on Japan's path and what it really does is give you a history a recent history of Japan uh from basically from the rubble to the bubble the rubble of World War II to the massive bubble that uh came out of it over the the uh 20 25 years after the war and Japan turned itself into a powerhouse, an economic pow- manufacturing powerhouse. But at the same time, they had bubbles that were just unbelievable. Uh, real estate and stock market. You know, the PE in their stock market was, I think it was 60 or 70. When we get up into the 30s, that's considered very bubblish here. Uh, when you look at their real estate values, at one point, land or square footage for Tokyo apartments was going for 139000 a square foot. That means the office that I'm in here, which is about 10 by 10, would be about a $1.4 million apartment. Um, d- just the land, ast- land values were just astronomical. And the debt was supported by land values, and land values were used to take on more debt. And it just became this vicious circle where all the debt was heavily reliant on on land and stock prices. Um, so in in the late 80s, the government and the Bank of Japan came in and said, we got to slow this down, which which point was way too late. They popped the bubble. The banks, the whole banking system would have collapsed, would have made our Great Depression look like a little recession. But they came in there, they, they, they saved the banks, they kept them on life support. And as a result, uh, Japan's economy is still below where it was in 1995. Uh, their stock market just hit a 
fresh record high going all the way back to 1989. Um, so you know, when you talk about Japan's problems, one of them is that they had a bubble that's incomprehensible and nothing compared to what we're going through. You know, and then they have demographic issues. They have many other issues, too. So it, it's not necessarily a fair comparison comparing Japan to the U.S. But again, we are increasing our debt way beyond our ability to pay our debt. And that by definition is a, is a bubble. It is a Ponzi scheme and it either has to change or it will pop at some point. Um, so, so there are similarities, there are differences and I'll get to the differences in a, in a second section, but it's worth really appreciating where Japan is, why they're, where they're at now and what's happened over the last 30, 40 years. Yeah, no, and again, when you kind of come back and look at, you know, the the amount of interventions that's required by a country that's about a third of the size of the U.S., you know, they've done more in QE and, and bond buying and everything else to try to support their economic growth than would be basically about three times the size of what we done, have done in the U.S. because of their relative size. But, you know, they have they've got a, 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 a very big pension problem, just as we do with our Social Security and Medicare um, they've got, you know, this problem with, you know, valuations, debt, and and have, have been unable to generate really any type of inflation in their economy for decades because of all this debt that they continue to carry. And, and they have to keep interest rates suppressed near 1% because of the debt issue. So if interest rates go up much, then they've got a debt problem just like we do. So, you know, this is, right. you know, it's, well, it's, 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 it all has a, a deleterious effect on their youth, which, you know, their youth isn't getting married because they don't have job prospects. Uh, they've got a, a very a rapid aging, you know, population just like we do as well. So there's so many similarities between the U.S., what we have in the U.S. and what's going on in Japan that it's, you know, all we got to do is look at them and just say, look, this is this is the trajectory we're on. And yeah, there are some differences. You know, we, we have a lot more resources, et cetera. But there's a lot of similarities between the aging demographic, the pension system, the amount of debt, and the leverage that we have within the system. And, and, and I think you, you kind of just mentioned one of the big ones, the central bank, it's fiscal dominance. Basically, the central bank has to manage the, com the country. You know, they've had interest rates. They just raised interest rates to zero to 0.10 percent. It was negative for the last six or seven years. That was a big move. They raised rates. Now they're at just a hair above zero. Think about that. And, and that's the problem is that the central bank has had a buy. They own over half their treasury securities, a third of their stock ETFs. Uh, they own corporate bonds. They've basically had to take control of the markets. They've, they've, uh, you know, and, and the point of this is that at the end of the day, they've destroyed whatever capitalism they've had because the central bank has had to come in and take control of the markets. And that's the disturbing path that we're on. The Fed has increasingly had uh, to become they own more, more and more they've dominant in the financial markets to help pay for the debt, to help the government fund at low levels, to help the economy fund its debt at lower than where than levels than where they should be. And when you keep doing that, you erode capitalism and capitalism has proven to be the best way to to help the wealth of the entire nation, not just the rich, but the poor as well. We have the wealthiest poor in this country because we have the purest brand of capitalism, but it's eroding. And that's probably the most disturbing part of the linkage between us and Japan. Yeah, no, and that's right. And, and it is a shame because, you know, it, you know, we've got to be we have to we have to clarify one thing, though. Capitalism is fine. There's nothing wrong with capitalism. You know, there's seven million businesses that have been started on TikTok. So the ability to go out and start a business and participate in capitalism is just fine. There's nothing stopping you in the U.S. You go to other countries, your ability to start a business is greatly eroded. Um, but in the U.S., you want to go start a business today. You've got an idea, an invention, uh, an attitude, whatever it is. And if you want to go do it, there's nothing stopping you from taking the risk to go do it. But to your point, Mike, the 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 uh, what seems to be the erosion of capitalism really isn't that. It's the it's the rise of corporatism that's really the problem. 
and you know we have this issue with corporations that are influencing politics, influencing policy, influencing social media that is creating this environment where the idea of the ability to generate wealth through capitalism has been eroded, but that's really not the case. But the problem that is created by corporatism is a real issue that at some point we're going to have to address. All right, quick break. We'll come back. Pick up with Michael Leibowitz on the other side. We'll talk a little bit about inflation here in the U.S. As, as I noted, it's upticked here recently. We'll kind of dig into some of the recent CPI report and see if it's really an inflation issue or if it's just a temporary anomaly. Don't go away. More of that coming up right after the break. investment advice blog it's required reading for the informed investor catch it today at realinvestmentadvice.com got a burning financial question you've always wanted to ask richard rosso and danny ratliff stocks or bonds annuities or not who does your hair our next candid coffee goes back to our roots and back to the kitchen table with an open season session for any and all of your questions saturday april 20th what about tax loss harvesting should i take social security now where'd you get that snappy robe register today for our open season candid coffee at realinvestmentadvice.com for just about anything you want to know. Where'd you get those shoes? realinvestmentadvice.com Hi, Lance Roberts here. If you're like most people, your 401k plan represents the bulk of your retirement assets. And unfortunately for many, managing your 401k plan can be difficult. There's so many choices, so many things to consider. With just a quick email, a couple of questions, you can put RIA advisors to work for you managing your 401k plan. Just simply click ask a question at realinvestmentadvice.com or give us a call at 855-RIA-PLAN. That's realinvestmentadvice.com. The Real Investment Show. And now, another page from the Real Investment Advisors Investing Manifesto. Manage risk and volatility rather than trying to manage gains. You don't have to be right all the time. Long-term investing success is a 70% gain. Let us help you reach your financial goals with RIA Advisors. Neither bull nor bear. RIA Advisors. 281-501-1791 or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. Can't catch the whole show now? Listen to our podcast later at realinvestmentadvice.com. Danny, you know inflation's getting bad. You know, you remember back in the day when strippers used to have names like Crystal and Diamond after something really expensive? No. The Real Investment Show yeah. podcast. Well, now you go to the men's club. It's like, welcome to the stage, gas and eggs. <laughs> so, I mean, you just know stuff's getting bad, man. Inflation. Same show, your schedule. Where'd you get this from, Lance? Is this? Oh, I was thinking about this last night. I was like, you know. At realinvestmentadvice.com. Because it's on all cash business. Yeah. When it comes to wealth management, most people think of stocks and bonds, but it's like enjoying one layer in a seven layer cake. At RIA Advisors, we want to make sure you get your cake and eat it too. Social Security, Medicare, creating a tax-friendly retirement paycheck, perhaps you're saving for college. How about life insurance, guaranteed income solutions, all along with comprehensive planning. At RIA, a holistic approach to your money is our priority. Call us today, 855-RIA-PLAN or find us online at realinvestmentadvice.com. Real investmentadvice.com. Health and financial security touches everyone within your organization. Offering benefits for all doesn't need to be complicated. Hi, I'm Tom Allen, Senior Benefits Consultant at RIA Advisors. RIA Benefits provides independent expertise to find solutions that speak to the mission of your business, the culture you want to establish, and the budget you are able to work within. Book a free consultation with me at realinvestmentadvice.com slash retirement, and we'll find a solution that takes care of your most important asset, your people. realinvestmentadvice.com slash retirement, realinvestmentadvice.com. The Real Investment Show YouTube channel has all our videos ready for your easy access. Like Technically Speaking Tuesday, Financial Fitness Friday, plus each day's radio shows. Subscribe and bookmark our YouTube channel at realinvestmentadvice.com. You're listening to The Real Investment Show. And welcome back to the show this morning. Um, okay, before we get into inflation, Mike has one more comment uh, on capitalism he wants to make, and then we'll get to our inflation update. So go. 
<laughs> Thank you. Uh, so the, the one thing that separates capitalism from socialism, from even communism, it's all about the degree of government interference. Capitalism has the least, and as you kind of go through socialism towards communism, there's more and more government interference, government control. We talked about Japan. Japan put themselves into a state of pseudo-socialism because their central bank and government have so much dominance over their markets and, and other aspects of their economy. Well, that's what's going on in the U.S. As our debt becomes more and more overwhelming, the Fed has to take more control. The government has to, feels like it has to better micromanage more so. And as the Fed and the government get more involved, you're slipping down from, you know, somewhere between capitalism and socialism. And that's, again, that's what really hurts because capitalism is what makes the most people the most prosperous. And again, it's not just the rich, it's everyone. So we're all being, you know, from the poorest to the richest are all being affected by what the government's doing to support these onerous levels of debt. Well, okay, and, and, point, yeah, and, and <laughs> well, that kind of actually dovetails right into inflation because, you know, this is, you know, part of this transition from capitalism to socialism is the demand by the populace for more government support. And so, you know, we started this in 2020. That's where we really made a big turn towards t socialism in 2020 by sending out checks to households and by doing massive amounts of interventions and bailing out student loans and you name it. But this is stuff that people are demanding, right? If you want to be in office, then you've got to mm -hmm. give the people what they want. And, you know, there's an old saying about, you know, once a population, you know, figures out they can gift themselves a paycheck from the treasury, then it's kind of the the end of of the republic as you know it. And, you know, we're rapidly heading in that direction because now the people have figured out that if they just stomp their feet enough and 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 throw their hands around and, and cry out loud enough that the government will start giving them stuff. And we've seen changes to legislation, to checks to households, to all kinds of government support, new new program initiatives, DEI, et cetera, all to try to quell the masses. But this is that turn from capitalism to you know, towards that path towards socialism where the government has more control over it. But that, that kind of brings us to the inflation point because inflation is really the spark of that because when things become more pricey, then the population demands support. And as we've seen inflation go up, we've seen more people, you know, complaining about the inflationary push. And now every time inflation ticks up or down, it's, it's, it's an immediate headline because we're all wanting the Fed to step in and start cutting rates to help support the economy and to support the markets, but you can't. They can't do that if inflation is going up. So let's talk about this latest inflation report. It did tick up a bit, but the only thing that was actually up in the most recent report was transportation and basically healthcare services. Which we, you know, this is the the beginning of the new year, so we see a lot of healthcare. You know, this is the time of the year where healthcare plans are getting renewed, they're getting updated, et cetera. And so pricing adjustments happen at the beginning, right at the end of the year, right at the beginning of the year. So we're seeing that um, kind of uptick in health services. We've seen an uptick in an energy cost, which is reflected through transportation. But if you take a look at housing or um, and food and beverages, actually on a month over month basis, those two very large components of inflation actually tick down. And, and and again, there's a big lag with housing, which is still kind of working its way through the inflation. Yeah, you know, you you started you started the show today talking about supply and demand. So you know, there are people you know talking about. There's a lot of pundits talking about inflation, and it's going to go all the way back up again, and it's going to stay sticky at these levels forever. And you know, there are guesses all over the map. And there are some saying that we're going to have, you know, deflation, disinflation. Um, but look, at the end of the day, it's supply and demand. And when you kind of think about both factors, what's driving both factors, in order to get inflation back up to seven, eight, nine percent like we had, we had massive supply line issues. Those issues are gone. You know, you'll hear, oh, well, the port of Baltimore is closed. So what? It's the 10th or 13th largest port in the United States. 
there's two ports within 200 miles of it that can handle a good chunk of that traffic. They've already opened part of the channel, allowing boats to, to at least get out and maybe some of them to get in. So yeah, there's always supply issues, right? There's storms that, that shut roads down, that shut cities down. There's, there's you know all kinds of events, but the bottom line is the supply side of the story has pretty much healed or is healing very quickly. So then you say, okay, well, that's half the story. What about the demand side? Well, job, you know, according to the BLS, the unemployment rate is very low. Uh, so that, that both, that's good for demand, but we're not getting the checks from the government, the stimulus, the direct stimulus from the government that we were getting that drove demand. When we look at the saving, the savings graph the personal savings graph for this country was unbelievable. It's, you know, when you look at it, it looks like a flat line, a mountain in 2020, 2021, and it's come all the way back down to the flat line. That was the surge in demand, coupled with the lack of supply that gave us 9% inflation. We don't have that anymore, right? We are normalizing both the supply side and the demand side of the equation. And it doesn't happen overnight but it's working back towards where it came from. And there's a reason and reason inflation was running two or even below 2% that the Fed was constantly whining that inflation wasn't at 2%. They wanted more inflation to get it to 2% because the natural, the natural growth of the economy is sub 2%, which jibes with a, you know, sub 2% inflation rate. And that's what we're normalizing too. And there's, you know, as the Fed has said numerous times this week, going to be bumps in the road. And, you know, like you said, Lance, you know, health insurance resets in January. Well, that's going to cause, you know, if they go up, that's going to cause a bump in January. Uh, but there's a lot of other factors and we're actually getting to a softer seasonality wise, a softer, lower inflation part of the year as we get to April, May, June. So, you know, again, but that doesn't mean, you know, we may see lower than expected readings in those months. But again, that doesn't make the trend either. It's going to be a slight, you know, a, a trend lower back towards 2% over time with bumpiness going both ways. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, you know, and, and again, you were talking about supply and demand. Take a look at retail inventories. Even on, a, even on an inflation adjusted basis, retail inventories are surging right now. So again, you know, to the supply issue, there there is becoming an oversupply of goods uh, available for sale. And as demand continues to slow down, as people kind of contract from, you know, the inability to make ends meet, you know, we've talked about recently that people are opting not to eat out as much. Um, they're not, they're, they're cutting back on deliveries. They're cutting back on areas that they can cut back on. Well, that all leads to less demand for products and services and so, again, like we saw in the ISM services report yesterday, prices are declining. We're seeing demand declining across the board. That, that, that is all deflationary in its nature because you have rising supply of products and services available for sale, but less demand for those, which means if I want to sell it, I've got to cut my prices. Right, right. The service sector ISM was pretty stunning how far prices fell. Mm -hmm. And, you know, employment is negative in both the ism manufacturing and services report so uh, you know i just don't think job growth is as robust as the bls is saying even the adp which came in with a you know you said a strong number it was yeah. only 185,000 jobs right well it was the stronger BLS than it was been, stronger than expected i should say that right Right. Well, I mean, it was stronger than it's been for the last few months, too, mm -hmm. but it's been in the lower 100s compared to BLS. It's been between 200 and 300. And those indicators are typically very aligned. So, you know, I think what we have and I, I'm not saying any of this is to to for political purposes. I just think the statistical you know, data, the data, the statistics they use to calculate these numbers is a little flawed because this is a different environment. People aren't taking jobless claims because you can go work for Uber and make more money than jobless claims. So is jobless claims a good number anymore? It, it has meaning. The trend is 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 important. But 
whether it's 220,000 or 250,000 or 280,000, I just don't know if it matters as much as it it used to. Well, the Philly Fed just came out recently and said that the jobs numbers have been overstated by 800,000 jobs, which right. if you took out those 800,000 jobs, it would pretty much more or less align with the ADP report. So exactly. so so again, you know, it's but but again, you know, it's you know, there's mathematical adjustments, you know, we have these seasonal adjustments that we make to the BLS number. There is the birth death adjustment, which is the number of businesses that are being created or or shut down. And every month that adds 250,000 people to the role. So, you know, there's so much of these guesses and assumptions that go into this this employment report that we rely on. Um, it's, it's quite it's, it's actually quite fascinating how much we rely on this employment report that is a massive amount of just guesses. <laughs> At what's going on with the employment? I think that there's there's much better real time indicators we can look at. ADP is one of those, but uh, you know, hey, it is what it is. All right, quick break. We'll come back, get ready to wrap up the show as markets set to open up nicely this morning. S and P's up about twenty points right now. Nasdaq up over a hundred. So the bull continues. Uh, we'll talk about uh, what to expect today. Don't go away. Get daily investment news you can use. Delivered at the speed of the internet at realinvestmentadvice.com. Got a burning financial question you've always wanted to ask Richard Rosso and Danny Ratliff? Stocks or bonds? Annuities or not? Who does your hair? Our next Candid Coffee goes back to our roots and back to the kitchen table with an open season session for any and all of your questions. Saturday, April 20th. What about tax loss harvesting? Should I take Social Security now? Where'd you get that snappy robe? Register today for our open season and candid coffee at realinvestmentadvice.com for just about anything you want to know. Where'd you get those shoes? Realinvestmentadvice.com. When it comes to wealth management, most people think of stocks and bonds, but it's like enjoying one layer in a seven layer cake. At RIA Advisors, we want to make sure you get your cake and eat it too. Social Security, Medicare, creating a tax friendly retirement paycheck. Perhaps you're saving for college. How about life insurance? Guaranteed income solutions, all along with comprehensive planning. At RIA, a holistic approach to your money is our priority. Call us today, 855-RIA-PLAN, or find us online at realinvestmentadvice.com, realinvestmentadvice.com. The Real Investment Show. Small businesses are discovering that attracting and retaining top talent come down to more than just salary. In today's highly competitive job market, compensation is more than just wages. Hi, I'm Tom Allen, RIA Advisors Retirement Plan Consultant. Healthcare and retirement plans can make the difference in hiring and retaining the best employees. We can show you how to build an affordable, effective employment package that delivers true value for your workers and your business. Call me toll free at 855-RIA-PLAN or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. And now, another page from the Real Investment Advisors Investing Manifesto. Bulls win in bull markets. Bears win in bear markets. Eagles soar above and take advantage of opportunity. Let us help you soar as you reach your financial goals with RIA Advisors. Neither bull nor bear. RIA Advisors, 281-501-1791 or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. You're listening to The Real Investment Show. And welcome back to the show this morning. So as I was discussing in the open of the show this morning, you know, it's been just a perfect trend higher in the market as uh, really ever since November. Um, at that, remember back in November, the amount of bearish sentiment out there was very high. Bullish sentiment was very low. And that marked the bottom of that decline we had last summer. And since then, it's just been a one-way kind of ride higher. And it, it's just been a very steady, low volatility advance. And, and and again, as I was saying this morning, you know, it's the perfect Bernie Madoff trend. You know, and the, the reason we, if you don't know about Bernie Madoff, 
Uh, he was running a massive Ponzi scheme heading up into 2008. And what got him, what got Bernie Madoff, and there's there's actually a couple of really good um, movies that they've made about the Bernie Madoff uh, you know, kind of scheme or scam um, and that you can go watch. And, and they're worth watching to understand that if you don't really understand what happened with Bernie Madoff and why it was important. Um, Alan Stanford uh, of Stanford Financial, actually here in Houston, very much the same thing. So, you know, what got them, what got both of them was generating these rates of return that had detached from the underlying market. And so, you know, Bernie Madoff was running a $50 billion Ponzi scheme. He had his own accounting firm. He had his own RA, he had his own, uh, his own trading firm. And so he was just taking in money and, and you know, kind of manipulating statements and was just generating 12% rates of return every year. And of course, people were getting sucked into this. Like, man, 12% a year. I'm just, I need that. <laughs> well, all he had to do was during the financial crisis, all, all Bernie Madoff had to do in the financial crisis would just say, you know what? I took huge bets on mortgage-backed securities to generate 12% rates of return for you guys. And they all went to zero. And he would have gotten away with it. But he didn't. And, so, and this is the same thing with Alan Stanford, who was creating these you know, 10% rates of return with CDs in a bank that he owned. The, the, what always gets the scammer is that they continue to try to run the scam. And then at some point, something happens. Everybody looks at you and goes, how are you doing that exactly? And that's what happened with Bernie Madoff is that he generated a 12% rate of return in a year where the market was down 52%. Everybody went, huh? <laughs> so, you know, and that's why it's so perfect. It's just every year, you know, that he was just making these 12% rate of returns. That's the Bernie Madoff market we have right now. It's just every time we get to the 20 day moving average, the computer algos kick on and we buy that, that dip to the 20 day. And I mean, just perfectly yesterday, the markets came down in the morning, touched the 20 day moving average, and then shot up about nine o'clock in the morning yesterday or 10 o'clock in the morning yesterday. Uh, just went straight up, and we traded in positive territory for the rest of the day. This market um, this morning is going to open up a bit stronger. But, you know, Mike, this has been, you know, a, a very tough market to be bearish on. If you're trying to short the market or try to, you know, bet against the market, it's just been a losing bet um, ever since November. The 20 day moving average. Yeah. As long as you know how to chart that, <laughs> you can chart this straight line. Uh, going back to Bernie for a sec, Bernie Madoff for a second. It's interesting. The one that really, what really got him in trouble was a guy named Harry Markopoulos. I believe mm -hmm. that's yeah, his name. Yeah, that's right. He's a whistleblower. About, so Bernie Madoff went down in what, 2008, 2009? Yeah. Eight. Yeah, well, yeah, he, well, he went down in nine, but they, they, they figured out they what was going on eight. in 2008. Yeah. So Harry Markopoulos was working for some sort of investment fund. I can't remember. In 2000, someone came to him and said, hey, look at this guy's returns. How can we replicate this? And basically, they showed him what you were referring to as the Bernie Madoff line, straight 12% returns every single year. And he knew, he, he has basically said instantly that that Bernie Madoff line is a fraud. You can't have perpetual outsized returns like that. And you know, it took, he, he presented his, his evidence to the SEC a couple times. It took him a while to figure out what Bernie was doing. Um, and basically he couldn't figure it out until he realized it was fraud. He tried every iteration possible to get returns like that and they just don't exist. Um, eventually after going to see the SEC a few times and they said, get away, he's fine. <laughs> they finally well, figured out that he wasn't. Yeah. But, and, and real quick, let me just interrupt why the SEC and the, and actually he went to the NASDAQ, um, right. and, and also reported him to the NASDAQ and they all said, Go away. You know, stop bugging. Bernie Madoff sat on the board of the NASDAQ. I mean, this guy was very influential on Wall Street. Everybody trusted this guy on Wall Street because he was so well connected. He was on all the right boards. He was on the board of the NASDAQ. I mean, you you just he inserted himself in all the right areas and with 50 billion under management, he was he was a, a, a big swinging guy on on Wall Street. So everybody trusted him. A big swinging guy. Well, I can't use the right word. <laughs> we are on radio, so. True. True. Yeah, it's a big swing in Richard. <laughs> the, the point is, 
if it looks too good to be true, it's too good to be true. And look, I'm not saying that this market is a fraud or a Ponzi, but it's I too am. good to be true. <laughs> but it can continue for a long time. And, you know, you just have to realize that markets don't trend in straight lines like it's doing. At some point it will break. And right now, you know, we're being gifted with this 20 day moving average, which has proven to be just an incredible line of support every time it gets down there. So it's a very easy way to follow the market to to know when to stay with the trend, to know when you may want to protect yourself. Um, but that's the environment we're in. And it's you know kind of going back to what we said earlier. It's very driven by what the Fed may or may not do. And you know that's why unemployment tomorrow is going to matter, because it may persuade the Fed one way or another. Every time they give speeches, the, the choice of words, the adjectives, the verbs, they all matter because we're in a market that's increasingly more and more dictated by what the Fed will or won't do or what they say or won't say. Which is a shame, right? I mean, and this, and this and really this, you know, you said, well, you know, we're not saying the market's a Ponzi scheme. It kind of is, though. I mean, in, in a way. And what I mean by that is, is that, you know, we no longer invest based on fundamentals or earnings or, you know, what actually creates value in the company and in the markets over time. I and mean, like, you know, value has vastly underperformed growth this year. So, you know, nobody's interested in value stocks. We're only interested in stocks that can generate, you know, these high rates of growth and earnings, supposedly. And we're paying vast multiples of this, but it's all premised on this idea that the Fed is going to be accommodative, provide low rates, provide low, you know, provide liquidity. And that's kind of in a nature, that's that deformation of the markets. And again, this also, uh, you know, goes into the whole passive indexing problem. You know, ETFs are great. I've got nothing against ETFs, but 27% of all flows went into passive indexes um, over the last year. And, and so every time that money goes into an index, it supports just a handful of stocks that are the largest weighted stocks in the market. So, you know, we get these deformations in the markets that, you know, that detach from the underlying fundamentals. And that's and that's what I'm saying. It's not a Ponzi scheme, but, you know, it's not it's also not based on realistic fundamentals. It's this whole idea of just banking on liquidity pushes by a central planner. And you wrote an excellent article this week on the wealth gap. Mm hmm. And what a lot of it comes down to, not all of it, but a lot of it is it's who owns stocks. It's the upper 10%. And even within the 10%, it's largely the upper 1%. So all of these machinations to, to prop the markets higher, whether it's direct or indirect, all these things the government and the Fed are doing that keep the market higher and just running in this Bernie Madoff line are helping you know, 10% or less of the population, leaving everyone else in the dust, the middle class, mm -hmm. the lower classes in the dust. And, you know, wealth gaps, a, a story for another day. But that's another si a brutal side effect of what's going on. Well, and again, that and, and that wealth gap, though, that does go back to what we were talking about earlier on the show about Japan and really kind of the undermining of, of capitalism, so to speak, is that, you know, there hasn't been you know, this, you know, capitalism is supposed to lift everybody, not equally, but should lift the population as a whole, right? And and we haven't really seen that effect for quite some time because of this shift from, and, what, and, and this has basically been a function of policy choices that, and, and, and really directly an impact from the Fed by the Fed doing all the things they've been doing over the last decade. It's been a massive wealth transfer from the middle class to high income earners who own the businesses, who have the, the political connections, who have the ability to take advantage of the markets that the middle class and the lower middle class don't because all their capital is just going into just trying to make ends meet. And so the, the more that we do these things, and again, you know, I'm, I'm not picking on Elon Musk, but we pass policies that, oh, we all need to drive EVs. Well, that extracted capital from the middle class who went and bought the EVs and transferred it to Elon Musk. That's just a simple example of what I'm talking about when we talk about a wealth transfer mechanism. That's a policy choice made that happen. And we've given tax credits to help make that happen. We've done all kinds of things to help support that market. 
and we've now extracted capital from the middle class who can least afford to, to, to lose it and have moved it to the upper class. And again, it's just it's just the way the market works. But that's the problem. We talk about the problems of capitalism. That's one of them. But it's policy choices. It's not pure capitalism. Mike, last word. Got 20 seconds. And it's all being voted in. So we're to blame. It's not just the politicians. Yeah. Uh, real quick, closing note. Kathy Wood says Tesla is going to $2,000. So if you believe Kathy Wood, there's your next trade. All right. <laughs> got to wrap up the show for this morning um all right we'll be back uh tomorrow morning uh danny ratliff richard rosso here in the morning for the for the financial fitness friday and we'll be back on monday have a great weekend our newsletter this weekend is on inflation the recent inflation uptick is it sustainable that's in this weekend's newsletter all right it's all at the website millinvestmentadvice.com have a great day